Hopefully, after this session, you will start to reconsider your own role within your own organization. Could you be the ones that uh, would be driving RPA developments within your, your own company? My name is Tuomas Lempian, and I'm the team lead for our technical QA team at Veikkaus. I've been doing uh, for QA work for six years now, uh, three years in my current role. And the ones who don't know what Wakehouse is actually about, Wakehouse is the state-owned company who has the sole right to host all gambling-related activities in Finland. The monopoly holds uh, well in the physical world, so basically for the slot machines, gaming arcades, casinos. But in the online world, we are facing a completely open competition since anyone is allowed to operate and advertise as long as they're doing that outside the Finnish domains. And online, that is easy. Here are some brief numbers. For 2018, unfortunately, the numbers for 2019 weren't ready this early of 2020, but uh, the big picture is still the same. Uh, the uh, key point is I want you to uh, take into account that we are running by far the biggest online store in Finland. We are like five or ten, ten times bigger than the second biggest online store in Finland, which should be verkokauppa.com currently. Antti Karilainen started with the topic really well uh, one and a half hours ago. And I want to elaborate that stuff until went through. Uh, but to get to today's point of RPA and QA work, let's for a brief moment consider that you've always dreamed of reaching the highest peaks of the world. So basically reaching the top of Mount Everest. There are multiple ways how you can achieve your goal. The typical and the easy solution uh, people are taking is the climber's pass. So basically, you want to climb up all the way from the bottom of the hill to the top of the mountain. In order to do that, you need to be preparing really well. Um, you can't do Mount Everest as your first mountain. You need to pack a shitload of gear. The walk will be really, really long. It will contain a lot of risk risks. Uh, you need to prepare for all kind of weather conditions that can take place on those high altitudes. And not to mention, uh, climbing Mount Everest is shitty expensive. It's really, really expensive. And the journey contains a lot of bumps that you can't be prepared for. Your second option is taking a helicopter ride. Way easier, and by the way, way, uh, way cheaper as well. Uh, I, by the way, needed to check that whether mankind has ever developed a helicopter that can reach that high altitudes. And yes, the answer is that such machines do exist. In both of these cases, our uh, starting point, so basically the bottom of the mountain and your destination, the top of the mountain, are equal. Yet, methods of reaching your goal are drastically different. In the first option, we are only considered about the journey. We want to climb up ourselves. Uh, and in the second option, we are only considered about the, our of the destination. We w just want to get uh, to the top of Mount Everest, no matter what. From this analogy, let's uh, go next to the world of IT development. For a moment, let's imagine that this maze we have here is our system under test. So you want to be testing this maze. And your goal is to get from point A to point B. If you would be doing test automation for this maze, uh, for most likely uh, the first test scenario you will be applying is the happy day, sunny day scenario where you'll be walking the easy route from point A to B, something like this. As your second test, you would be most likely doing alternative routes. Yes, they exist. You can check for yourself. Uh, you'll be most likely creating automation for verifying that you can go backwards in case of hitting dead ends. If you would be doing anomaly tests, you would be burning, burning down one rope, so one wall, and checking how the maze functions then. Performance testers would be applying, let's say, 100 mice inside the maze and see how it functions when it's overcrowded. But all the tests you would be doing when doing test automation would be the ones that a user would be doing, like normal user behavior. In the world of RPA development, uh, things are a little different. If the uh, last maze example would have been the hill climbing example, so basically you are considered of the journey, how you are getting from point A to point B. In the world of RPA, we are only considered about the destination. By the way, what is the easiest route from point A to B? Anyone? 
Great. This is the thing we want to be doing when doing RPA development. We don't care what is actually happening inside that maze, that system, that process. We want to skip all that and focus on the essentials. Stuff we might be seeing inside the maze are, for example, user interfaces, databases, cloud services, SaaS services, and for the love of God in some processes, sending emails. Skip that. Don't do it at all. Let robots do the things that they are good, in, good at. And this is the way of taking a helicopter ride to the top of Mount Everest. A lot easier, a lot cheaper, and we are only considered of getting from point A to B. And always remember to check beyond point B and behind point A, since typically uh, the business owners of uh, processes tend to believe that they're actually working with the initial source of, uh, of the data. That rarely applies. Typically, there are other primary sources for that data and destinations you should be applying when doing RPA development. In the world of RPA and test animation, I've listed here two uh, differences. Uh, Ant listed four, uh, depending on how you count them, how you see them. As mentioned, the scope, the reason why are we doing test automation versus RPA is drastically different. So the scope varies a lot. In test automation, we are considered about the journey, not the destination itself that much. The second difference, and by the way, the only difference I find uh, valuable is the delivery speed. When you're doing test automation, and you get uh, your application under, your, under test in your hands for the first time, you're easily able to do the first initial tests within the first hours, first, first days you've been working with the application. So basically, do the login test. Submit a valid username, valid credential, uh, a valid password, and submit, verify that you've been logged in. Already that a simple and easy uh, test brings you a lot of value and information of your application you're actually testing. In the world of RPA, you rarely are able to deliver stuff in the, with that high speed, so the first uh, deliveries need to be in bigger patches. You need to be uh, analyzing the process more deeply before you can start automating stuff. However, I find uh, practical to list five nuances that I apply both in test automation and RPA. And these nuances lean towards uh, RPA in this sense. So uh, the first one, technology. When doing typical RPA pro processes, you are more likely working uh, with applications that are not in your own control. This basically means that uh, you're working with third-party applications where the automatability of those applications is not guaranteed. In those cases, you need to apply more complex automation technology, let's say image recognition, uh, OCR, in some uh, rare cases, speech recognition. This might be the uh, case you are facing also when doing test automation, but you are more likely facing this stuff when doing RPA. Popularization is the second nuance I've listed here. Uh, when you're doing RPA, you are more likely working uh, with people that are not technology oriented. If you're describing the work you're actually doing to a business owner when doing RPA, what you're actually doing, uh, these cool Python, uh, Python libraries and the S, you show them this uh, robot framework code, they don't under understand at all what you're actually trying to say. Uh, the thing I want to say here is that you need to uh, uh, express yourself in a more ab abstract level in order that the people you are working with do understand you. This might be also the case when doing test automation, but typically uh, this applies more when doing RPA. The three last ones relate to the fact that we are dealing with production data. When you're doing test automation and if your nightly builds and the tests for your nightly builds fail, it's typically not that big of a deal. You come back to work in the morning, check, okay, we had some flakiness in the environment, and then you fix it. And rerun your tests, and all is uh, good, good at green again. But when doing RPA, for example, if you've done a RPA case for your customer service, and the robot fails during evening time, and your customer service is relying on that robot, well, things aren't good in a good manner in that case. So when doing RPA, uh, do more stable 
scripts. And that is, by the way, easy. Bear with me now. It is easy to state that just uh, develop more stable scripts, but if you do proper RPA, so basically you skip the maze we just went through, you will get rid of most of the dependencies you have in your environments. The biggest reason for your flakiness in your tests when doing test automation is that you are doing it in end-to-end -end environments. You, uh, most likely your test environment is not matching your production environments, so your environment is more unstable. So when you're doing uh, proper RPA development, uh, skipping that shit in between that maze, you're most uh, like automatically getting more stable scripts. Uh, the fourth one, reporting requirements. Uh, as Antti already mentioned, uh, when doing RPA, you need to be 100% sure what was done and what was not done. If you lose a set of data when doing the test automation, once again, it might be a big deal, but most likely it's not that big of a deal. But when doing RPA, you need to be really sure what happens. So most likely, robot framework logs currently ain't enough for you, so you need to be developing something on top of that. Uh, but also when doing test automation, it might be the case once more that robot framework logs ain't enough for you. So thus, this stuff is leaning a little towards RPA. Last but not least, the security stuff. Don't know whether you've considered, but hopefully you do have some kind of uh, well-thought process how you're actually maintaining your credentials in your test environments. Who is able to access your test environments, your test code, uh, your test databases. The exact same stuff you need to apply when doing RPA. Yet, when you're naturally dealing with production data, you need to be more and more secure with that stuff so that nothing bad happens. If someone breaches your test databases, it's a bad thing. But if someone breaches your production databases, well, hell is loose in that case. Uh, so for example, uh, the credentials for your uh, RPA scripts, the credentials for the production databases, and test also when doing test automation, pay attention where are you uh, securing those credentials, since those are valuable stuff. You need to consider that stuff in both cases, but once more, a little more when doing RPA. If these are the differences, the stuff, that is the same, quite a lot. Even though we are skipping the maze when doing RPA, we are, we are still facing uh, normal interfaces. There might be user interfaces, APIs, databases. In both cases, test automation and RPA, that stuff is completely the same. Since the technology we face, the solutions for automating that stuff remains the same. If you face a user interface and can't use any other options, then apply Selenium. It will do the trick. Most likely, you will be needing a orchestration platform for your uh, RPA work as well. Use Jenkins, uh, Bamboo, anything that will work for you. Uh, you need version control in both cases. So the technology we need to utilize is the same. Practices in development, once more the same. When doing either of these cases, you want to make sure that your scripts are maintainable and well documented. If any other person uh, besides you touches your scripts ever, you want to make sure that he or she knows actually what uh, they are doing. Process in maintenance and incident management. Don't know, once more, if you consider when doing test automation, but you need to have a well-defined process for incident management and maintenance. If you're the one-man robot band, so basically the only guy who is doing test automation in your team, most likely your process is that when you come back to work in the morning, you fix the stuff that is broken. But when doing RPA, this must be applied also. You need to have proper methods of doing process maintenance and incident management. In test automation, incident management typically means uh, bugs. You report bugs. But uh, when doing RPA, you do report failures of your robot. But that is actually you are uh, reporting in both cases, that your tests failed or scripts failed due to any reason. The applications might be the same. Also, when you're doing, if you're doing test automation or RPA, 
you might be facing the exact same applications. This brings us to the four reasons why I find useful why QA should be the driver for RPA development. And we've been doing this for around one and a half years now, very successfully. Know-how, knowledge. You guys, you all know how to do RPA. We just went through that the stuff you should be doing is the same. Just uh, rethink why you are doing that stuff, apply the nuances we went through, and then you know it. It's that easy. There's nothing odd or big in that stuff when doing RPA development. The second one, reusability of scripts. If you're doing both test automation and RPA for the exact same applications, you may utilize the exact same scripts. So you don't need to do uh, the same work twice. Prioritization. If you are doing both test automation and RPA, the same guys, the same uh, resources within your company, uh, it automatically means that your automation resources are constantly developing that stuff that brings most value to your company. At a given point of time, it might mean that half of your stuff is doing RPA and half of the stuff is doing test automation. Let's say a half year later, it might be that uh, you are having no new RPA cases, but are solely focusing on test automation. But it's a good thing that uh, you need to make this same stuff uh, match in the same backlog, since then you are automatically uh, making people do that is the most optimal solution to do. The fourth one, last one, company knowledge. You ask most, uh, most of you are QAs, so you are the ones that are asking the stupid questions. Keep doing it. That, that is the thing uh, that different, differentiates you from the rest of the company. That is the stuff that it makes you actually good at your work. Keep asking the stupid questions. And when you are asking it, those stupid questions, it, uh, they give you a vision throughout the company, the applications, the processes people are doing. And when you know well the processes and stuff that people are actually doing with the applications you are developing, it enables you to see those labors and points where automation could be a good solution. Thus, if automation is a good solution, RPA might be a good solution for you. My hypothesis is that every company should have their own RPA evangelist. Uh, the evangelist should be a person who is naturally a spokesperson for RPA work, uh, but is the one who is the first contact of when you need a new RPA case to be evaluated, whether it should be automated or not. The one that easily sees whether a case would be 110 or 100 days of work, and how much would it save in labor from the manual process. Uh, but when talking about RPA within your own organization, uh, be careful with the pit hole that you could easily fall in that you would be promoting RPA just for the sake of RPA. Don't do it. You should be promoting RPA uh, for the sake of automation. So you want to uh, find out points where automation could uh, ease manual labor, and an RPA should be only one possible solution to your automation is issues. It's a good tool, but it should be not, not be the default tool when doing IT development. Normal IT automation should be the default answer, but in most cases, RPA is a really, really good tool uh, to do automation. So the thing I want you guys to take with me, with you from this presentation is that when you're going back to your own offices on Friday or Monday, depending, depending on how long you're going to stay tomorrow at the after party, is that when you're going back, reconsider that could you be the ones that actually would be doing RPA developments within your own company. Thanks. All right.
Uh, any questions for Tuomas? They're in the back. Uh, the organizers, for sake of uh, security, they asked me not to throw it anymore, so <laughs> let's pass, pass it there. <laughs> yeah, relatively well. Yeah, it, let's see how fast it can go. It's wait, climbing wait, wait. now, the it's, mic is climbing. It's soon there. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm very new to um, RPA and, the, and that concept. And I was just wondering um, if you're leveraging RPA um, solutions in a production system, how does that work with, without mutating um, production data? Or is that um, part, of the, part of the process? Uh, that depends highly on what you're actually doing. If your goal is to mutate the data, then you want to want to do it. But if your goal is just to utilize that data for some other purposes, then naturally just if you read those databases and, not, and never write the, to those production databases, nothing actually happens. So that, that depends highly on what you're doing, actually. Okay, thank you. More questions in the back? Now, now the mic is there, so it would be easy. So there, just pass it there on, on the left. Yeah. Yep. Oh. Don't throw it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hello. Uh, could you give some examples of what you're using RPA for at Veikkaus? Uh, currently, we've been utilizing, uh, for example, those cases we can tell you about uh, uh, taking uh, or processing invoices. One, one type of thing we've been doing. Uh, we are monitoring currently our open uh, sports game targets in the case of those events have actually started. For example, tennis matches uh, don't have a fixed starting time, so we want to make sure that uh, the betting for a tennis match is not open in case of that uh, tennis match has actually started. That is one thing. Uh, what could we mention also? Some internal stuff I'm not able to elaborate here, unfortunately. Uh, but we've got also uh, Veikkaus developers here, those software robot developers. So you can find them, look at the batches, and ask for more questions also. More questions there? Next, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you please elaborate more in the, let's say, the difference between the reporting in, R in RPA and in test automation, uh, what kind of metrics do you see that you need to have in RPA that are not typically available in test automation? Well, yeah, that's a good, good question. Uh, Antti already went through that stuff uh, partly in his presentation. Uh, as mentioned, uh, in RPA, you want to make sure that what transactions were done. So. Uh, how many times did we repeat this exact uh, same uh, RPA case or the script itself? And which pieces of data were utilized in those scripts? Uh, when doing test automation, we want to m monitor and maintain and measure uh, that's how those uh, tests did succeed. We don't care how many times we di did we actually uh, go through those scripts, but when doing test uh, RPA, we want to make sure that what was actually done, uh, the data is that the stuff that matters when doing RPA. More questions? Let's do one from there so we can exercise. Let's, let's get the uh, mic there. Slowly, don't throw it too far. We need to be safe. <laughs> Hi. Uh, do you do some validations or analytics uh, on some unexpected errors, for example, if you have? Uh, naturally, we do have metrics uh, how well our robots do uh, succeed. So, for example, let's say the one that is handle handling these 
payments. Uh, we are measuring that, yes, we have 99.4% of the transactions uh, it is the robots are doing are successful, and the 0.6% are failing due to multiple reasons. And in those cases, naturally, a human needs to elaborate, so what went wrong? So yes, we are doing metrics on how well the robots perform. Thank you. Maybe one more question uh, there in the back, if you can pass it there. Just a few rows per... Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, thanks for we're, the we're talk. We're breaking um, the rules. We're breaking the rules. <laughs> it's more you fun. Briefly, you briefly talked about uh, storing and transferring credentials. Yeah. I'd like to know your take on that, how it's best to be done. What's the safest way, in your opinion? <clears throat> I promise not to do this, this but uh, Veikkaus developers, hands up. Mm -hmm. Demo, please. <laughs> You'll see. Those guys in the middle, <laughs> ask those guys. Those, those are the guys that actually know the technology. I know barely all the minor parts of that. So they're the experts. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank, thanks for the questions. You can pass the mic here. Just throw it here if we want. Uh, let's, uh, well, this slow way is good. Thank you, thank you. All right, thank you, Tuomas. Thank you. <laughs>